So if I was to ask you what the connection was between the bottle of Tide detergent and sweat was, you probably think that's the easiest question that you're going to be asked in Edinburgh all week. But if I was to say that they're both examples of alternative or new forms of currency in a hyper-connected, data-driven global economy, you probably think I was a little bit bonkers. But trust me, I work in advertising. <laughs> <laughs> And I am going to tell you the answer, but obviously after this short break. So a more kind of challenging question is one that I was asked actually by one of our writers a couple of weeks ago, um, and I didn't know the answer. What's the world's best performing currency? It's actually Bitcoin. Now, for those of you who may not be familiar, Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency, a virtual currency, synthetic currency. It was founded in 2008 by this anonymous programmer using the pseudonym um, Satoshi Nakamoto. No one knows who or what he is. He's almost like the Banksy of the internet. And I'm probably not going to do it um, proper service here, but my interpretation of how it works is that bitcoins are released through this process of mining. So there's a network of computers, a challenge to solve a very complex mathematical problem, and the person that manages to solve it first gets the bitcoins. So the bitcoins are released, they're put into a public ledger called the blockchain, and then they float, so they become a currency. And completely decentralized, that's the sort of scary thing about this, which is why it's so popular. So it's not run by the authorities or the states, it's actually managed by the network. And the reason that it's proved very successful is it's private, it's anonymous, it's fast, and it's cheap. And you do get to the point where there are some wild fluctuations with Bitcoin. So in one level, um, it went from something like $13 to 266 literally in the space of four months, then crashed and lost half of its value in six hours. And it's currently around that kind of 110 dollar mark in value. But what it does show is that it's sort of gaining ground, it's gaining respectability. You get services like Reddit and WordPress are actually accepting Bitcoin as a payment currency now. And that's sort of showing you that people are actually placing trust in technology and it sort of started to, to trump and disrupt and interrogate traditional institutions and how we think about currencies and money. And that's not surprising if you think about the basket case that is the EU. Um, I think there was a Gallup survey out recently that said something like, in America, trust in banks is at an all-time low. It's something like 21%. And you can see here some photographs from London where Barclays sponsored the city bike scheme. And some activists have done some nice piece of uh, guerrilla marketing here and doctored the <laughs> slogans. Subprime pedaling, Barclays takes you for a ride. These are the more polite ones I could share with you today. Um, but you get the gist. So people have really started to sort of lose faith um, in institutions. And there's, a, there's a PR company called Edelman that do this very kind of interesting survey every year precisely around trust and what people are thinking. And this is a global survey, so these numbers are global. And what's interesting is that you can see that sort of hierarchy um, is kind of having a bit of a wobble, and it's all about heterarchical now. So people trust people like themselves more than they trust corporations and governments. And if you look at these figures for sort of the more developed markets like UK, Germany and so on, they're actually much lower. And I find it sort of scary. People are actually trusting business people more than they're trusting governments and leaders. So what's starting to happen? If you think about money, if you sort of boil money down to an essence, it is literally just an expression of value, an agreed value. So what's happening now in the digital age is that we can sort of quantify value in lots of different ways and do it more easily. And sometimes the way that we quantify those values, it makes it kind of much easier to create new forms and valid forms of currency. In that context, you can see that networks like Bitcoin suddenly start to make a bit more sense. So if you think we're starting to sort of question and disrupt and interrogate what money means, what our relationship with it is, what defines money, then the ultimate kind of extension of that is, is there a reason for the government to be in charge of money anymore? And so obviously I'm looking at this through a marketing prism. So from a brand perspective, you know, brands literally stand or fall on their reputations. And you think about reputation has now become a currency. You know, reputations are built on trust, consistency, transparency. So if you've actually decided that you trust a brand, you want a relationship, you want to engage with a brand, you're already kind of participating in lots of new forms of currency. So you think about loyalty. Loyalty essentially is a microeconomy. You think about the reward schemes, um, air miles. And the, the economist said a few years ago that there are actually more unredeemed air miles in the world than there are dollar bills in circulation. You know, when you're um, standing in line in Starbucks, 30% of transactions in Starbucks on any one day are actually being made with Starbucks star points. 
So that's the sort of Starbucks currency staying within its ecosystem. And what I find interesting is that Amazon has recently launched Amazon Coins. So admittedly, it's a currency at the moment that's purely for the Kindle, so you can buy apps and make purchases within those apps. But you think about Amazon, you look at those, the trust barometer that I showed you, where people are starting to trust businesses, especially businesses that they believe in and trust, more than governments. So suddenly, you start thinking, well, Amazon potentially could push this. It could become a natural extension that, as well as buying stuff, you know, take it out of the Kindle, you could buy books, music, real-life products, hard, you know, appliances and, and, and goods and so on. And suddenly, you're getting Amazon as a brand is going head-to-head -head with the Federal Reserve in terms of how you want to spend your money, you know, what money is, what, what constitutes money. And I'll get you back to Tide, the detergent now, as I promised. This is a fantastic article I came across in New York magazine where it was saying that drug users across America are actually purchasing drugs with bottles of Tide detergent. So they're going into convenience stores, stealing Tide, and a $20 bottle of Tide is equal to $10 of crack cocaine or weed. And what they're saying, so some criminologists have looked at this and they're saying, okay, Tide as a product sells at a premium. It's kind of 50% above the category average. It's infused with very complex uh, cocktail of chemicals, so it smells very luxurious and very distinctive. And being a Procter & Gamble brand, it's been supported by a lot of mass media advertising. So what they're saying is that drug users are consumers too. So they have this kind of, the, in their neural pathways, when they spot Tide, there's a shortcut. Say, so that is trust, I trust that, that's quality. So the, the, it becomes this unit of currency, which the New York Magazine described as a very oddly loyal crime wave, brand loyal crime wave. And criminals are actually calling Tide liquid gold. Now, what I thought was funny was a reaction from the, the, the P&G spokesperson that said, obviously tried to sort of dissociate themselves from drugs, but said that, yeah, it reminds me of one thing, and that's the value of the brand has stayed consistent. <laughs> Which backs up my point and shows he didn't even break a sweat when he said that. So that brings me back to the connection with sweat. In Mexico, Nike have run a campaign recently called literally Bid Your Sweat. So you think about, you know, these Nike shoes have got sensors in them, or you use a Nike fuel band that basically tracks your movement, your energy, your calorie consumption. And what's happening here, this is where you've actually elected to join that Nike community. You've bought into it. They're not advertising loud messages at you. And that's where advertising has started to shift now, is into things like services, tools, and applications. So Nike is literally acting as a well-being well partner, a health and fitness kind of partner and service provider. So what happens with this is they're saying, right, you have a data dashboard. We know how far you've run, how far you've moved, what your calorie intake, you know, all that sort of stuff. What you can do is, the more you run, the more points you get. And we have an auction where you can buy Nike stuff, but only by proving that you've actually used the product to do stuff. And you can't come into this. This is purely for the community that are sweating using Nike products. You can't buy stuff with pesos. You know, this is a, 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 literally a closed environment, a closed auction space. In Africa, you know, airtime has become literally a currency in its own right. People are used to, because mobile is king, they're very, very used to um, transferring money, making payments via mobile. And one of my favorite examples from a brand perspective going on is Vodafone, where in Egypt, lots of people make purchases in uh, markets and, and very small independent stores. Loose chains, small chains is a real problem. And what tends to happen is you buy a bunch of stuff, you're due, say, you know, like 10, 10 cents, 20 cents in change, the shopkeepers tend to give you things like an onion or an aspirin or a piece of gum because they don't have the small change. So what Vodafone came in and saw this problem, this consumer pain point, and they created some small change, which they call FACA, which literally sits and is given by the shopkeepers to people, and it's, it's credit that goes straight onto their mobile phone. So this currency becomes credit, which again is really, really interesting. And we did a survey that backs up the fact that 45% you know, of people in this very crucial demographic in the US was saying that, that they're comfortable using an independent or branded currency. So that's getting really interesting here, really interesting dynamic going on. And you think that you know, corporations should start taking their assets and thinking them in a different way and sort of trading them. Um, and it's, you, know, you think, is it much of a leap? You know, it seems like you know, far-fetched, but when you think about it, in America in 1860, there were 1,600 corporations issuing banknotes. There were 8,000 kinds of notes in America. And the only thing that stopped that, the, the government controlled 4% of the supply, and the only thing that stopped it was a civil war breaking out, and the government suddenly wanted to take control of the money. 
So government, money, war, <laughs> nothing changes there then. So, <laughs> so what I'm going to ask is basically, you know, is history repeating itself? You know, is technology making paper money feel outmoded? Are we decoupling money from the government? You know, you think about brands are starting to fill the gaps. Corporations are filling gaps that governments can't afford to fill. So I think, you know, we'll be standing on stage by buying a coffee, our organic fair trade coffee next year, using Ted Florins or Ted Shillings. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.